all of you who are here. Um, we are already 11 o'clock in the morning here on the East Coast, so let me go ahead and get started by telling you kind of who I am and uh, yeah, we'll just roll and we'll see how it goes. So um, I am Dr. Robin. I'm a former competitive beach volleyball player turned psychologist with continuing education in nutrition from the Center of Nutrition Studies at Cornell University. I am the CEO of a company called Champion Performance Development, where I do high performance coaching. I'm a professional confidant. I'm a speaker. Um, I do a lot of high performance work there. I'm also the co-founder of Whole Food Muscle, where we do all things food, fasting, and fitness on a foundation of performance psychology. And I'm the co-author of the book, How to Feed a Human. Let's see if I can get it so it's not glary. How to Feed a Human, which is available on Amazon. Uh, so yeah, so that's me. So today we're going to talk about stress eating. And there are two pieces to stress eating. And you're going to see me look to the side because I have my notes over here because I don't want to leave anything out. I want to make sure that I uh, share information, all the information that I wrote my notes on. Um, thank you, Kira. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Um, it's gonna, we're going to have a good time. So stress eating, two things, stress and eating. So we're going to talk about both parts of that um, and, and kind of I'm going to give you some tips about managing stress and then I'm going to give you some tips about uh, eating and ways that you can better nourish your body to help avoid eating the junk food that we all eat when we're stress eating. And I am going to try to pay attention to comments as we go. Hey, Christine. Hi. Thanks for saying hello. I really appreciate that. If you are here, do say hi. And I'm going to try and keep, I have two, my, two different mouses sitting on my computer here. So I've got one for this one with my notes and one for the computer where you guys are talking. So I'm really going to try to keep track of which one's which over here. So um, let's talk first about what is stress eating? Why, why do humans do it? And basically it's an un unhealthy coping mechanism that we use to self-soothe. Self-soothe, I can talk. And it's something we're usually taught in childhood. If you think about babies, if they're crying, what's, what do you do? You stick, some, you stick a pacifier in their mouth. And then with a toddler, you know, you might give them uh, something to chew on, to teeth. And so uh, as children, we are taught when we're upset, put things in our mouth. And um, as we age, our parents typically, you, you know, you'll get food as rewards or you'll get food if something bad happens. And we are taught to, to eat when we're stressed, when we're happy, when we're excited, when we're celebrating. And we forget because of that, we forget what hunger is. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about later about the difference between toxic hunger and real hunger. But you know, the, the stress eating is a normal reaction because we are taught from the time we're tiny, tiny to put things in our mouth when we're, when we're stressed or when we're unhappy and that makes us eat. Hi Kim, thanks for saying hi, I appreciate that. So first, what is stress? So stress is feeling responsible for something over which you don't have control. And in the workplace, uh, we, when someone gets overwhelmed with that, we call it burnout. Um, and that is something I've done a lot of work with, with corporate people about is burnout. But in our personal lives, it's the same thing where we, we feel responsible for something, but we have no control. And COVID-19 is definitely one of those situations. We feel responsible for keeping ourselves healthy, for keeping our families healthy, for not, if we do get sick, not infecting other people. So we're all going through all of these convoluted things to try and, you know, make other people feel safe, make ourselves feel safe, manage that anxiety, but we really don't have control over it. I mean, you can't see these germs. You can do only so much. And I think we're all currently living in a state of feeling like we're completely overreacting and then other times like we're completely underreacting and we should be doing more. And I think that that it creates a lot of stress. It creates a lot of anxiety. Hey, Michael. Hi. Thanks for saying hello. Um, so, I mean, are you guys feeling that? Do you feel like sometimes you feel like this is an overreaction? We shouldn't be doing this. This is crazy. And other times you're like, oh, my goodness, this is so scary. We should do more. I need to do more. I'm not doing enough. I know I kind of oscillate between those those two extremes. So if you know if you do, let me let me know if you're if you're kind of oscillating that way too. So our bodies, because we are in this state of stress, our caveman brain thinks that we're going to be eaten by a lion. So we're on high alert, and especially right now, I mean there is the real risk of death. I mean, and, and you see it in the press, and the press is definitely hyping it that this disease is deadly. If you get it, it could kill you. Um, so we do have that risk of death and your, you know, your body has that, oh, we used to get eaten by lions and that's super dangerous. So your cortisol level is going to go up. 
And when your cortisol level is up, you've probably heard about cortisol, it gets blamed for uh, belly fat, and it, but it's our stress hormone. It slows your digestion process. So if, when your cortisol level is high, your digestion slows down. So Michael's saying it is a balance and, it's, and you have to align each day and that's absolutely true. Um, when your digestion slows down, your body is going to crave super fast energy that's super easy to process. And in our world, that means fast food. Anything that's highly processed where most of the work has already been done. So you're talking fat, sugar, and salt. And that's what your body's going to crave. And I know if you're eating, if you're you know, stress eating, it's usually fat, sugar, and salt that you're, that you're going to reach for. And that's because your body is wanting to have really fast calories because it's slowing di down digestion so, so you can be in your fight or flight mode so you can manage your stress. And um, it's going to want to store energy because if you're under this stress, obviously you're going to need the energy. You're going to have to run away from that lion. And so your body is going to, it's going to want to store those calories. So you're going to, not only are you going to want to eat junk, you're going to, your body's not going to burn it. Then it's going to hang on to it. And uh, that's a really kind of catch 22 for, for everybody. It's not really good. Um, so this is, it's the reality of um, our, our life right now. That's the way it is. And so knowing it is part of the battle. Then we have to figure out, okay, how do we get our prefrontal cortex, which is this part of our brain, our logical part of the brain up here in the front. How do we get, in, get it involved so that we can not be uh, so anxious, so that we're not eating so much junk? Um, and how, how do we mitigate kind of this reality that we are dealing with cortisol, we are dealing with stress, we are dealing with feeling overwhelmed. Like, what are, we, what are we going to do about that? So I have a few tips to help you mitigate stress. I know yesterday uh, Matthew was on and he did a really good job of giving you guys some tips. So I'm going to repeat some of those and then I'm going to give you some new ones as well. So one of the first things you can do is move your body. And, um, you know, when you say the word exercise, people often think about, oh, I have to go and you know, like do an exercise routine or I have to go lift weights or I have to do whatever. Um, and those are great. Absolutely, I work out on a regular basis. I do recommend it. Working out is a great thing. Um, we are being very creative here at home trying to get our workouts in because we are usually gym rats. My husband's been like power lifting a chair over his head. It's, it's, it's really funny around here in the mornings when we're doing our exercise. But just moving your body is going to help kind of deal with the cortisol that that is going to be flowing so whether that means you're going to go for a walk or you know maybe just laugh find things find funny videos um you know on youtube to watch or funny movies anything that can help you laugh if your family makes you laugh do that if your family makes you stress maybe go to a different room um, but you're gonna dance i've been finding on youtube i've been finding line dances and i'm horrible at line dancing i am so bad it's not even funny but i've been doing it just because the music is fun and it's a it's a great opportunity to kind of move my body and do something that makes me feel good even though i'm horrible at line dancing and they still are allowing us to go outside as long as we're staying at least six feet away from each other. So go for a walk. It, here, it happens to be sunny today, and it's going to be almost 60 degrees. So I would encourage you, you know, go out, go for a walk, wander around. If, if you have the possibility, just stay six feet away from people. If that's what they recommend that we do. So another great options are to do Tai Chi or Qigong. Those are, um, again, videos free on YouTube that you can um, just you, YouTube for beginners and they're going to pop up. I, be, I have never done Qigong before, so I started trying that. Just a new thing to say, oh, is this fun for me? Do I like it? A way to move your body, a way to exercise, um, and a way to kind of control the breath. There's a little bit of moving meditation. So those are really, really good. The other thing you can do, um, the YMCA is offering free classes. So if you go, uh, it's virtual Y, um, and if you Google it, it should come up. Or if you go to the Y um, Facebook page, it comes up, and they have classes on there that you can take. And some of them are easier, and some of them are harder than others. But if you are a you know exercise class person, Though that's a great place. So that's one tip. Move your body. That's the, you know, one of the things you can do. The other thing that you can do is talk about it out loud. And I don't mean ruminate, which is just kind of go over and over and over again in your mind. Because what happens is that your logical brain doesn't really have access to your feelings. And so when your feeling brain starts having all this anxiety and all this stuff going on, your logical brain is like, 
disengaged. It knows that there's stress, it knows that there's a problem, but it's disengaged. My kids and I are going for a walk today. Yay, that's wonderful. Um, I love it that you're gonna go out. Um, I try to walk every day, that's great. So excited that it's sunny. I know, isn't it wonderful that it's sunny? Yes, I'm just, I'm so ready for it to be warm. So uh, we're talking about talk it out. Your logical brain does not have access to your feelings. And so if you keep those feelings inside and you don't ever articulate them, your logical brain can't really interact with them. It doesn't have access. You have to put it into words. So there's a couple of different ways you can talk out loud to yourself. Um, you know, go talk to yourself in the mirror or something like that. That's an option. You can talk to a friend. One thing to be aware of if you're talking to a friend, it does require reciprocation, which means um, if I call you and I unload on you, it means that at some point, I need to be accepting the fact that you're gonna call me and unload on me. And I think um, that a lot of people struggle with that, where so, there are, always seems to be one person in a friendship that feels like they're the listening person and the other person's always the talking person. They're, the reciprocation isn't there. The other thing that I found when people um, say that they're gonna to talk to their friends is there's a real feeling of judgment. Um, when you talk to someone who knows you and who's involved in your life, they tend to kind of hang on to that and they make judgments about that. So it's very different um, if you talk to a stranger. If you are in Delaware, join the country line dancing. I'm horrible. Oh my goodness, I'm horrible at line dancing. You do not want me there till I know what I'm doing. It's so bad. I'm just, a, I'm, I can ballroom dance. I cannot line dance. It's so silly. Um, so you may want to talk to a professional. And I know a lot of times that the cost of that is you just it's not an option but there are professionals now who are either offering discounted rates or like me are offering pay what you can um, i'm doing pay what you can sessions with no um, required number so most of the time when i work with people i say you know give me three months and i ask for a three months commitment but right now i'm offering pay what you can and just if you want just one session that's fine and i can do zoom or skype or phone and there are other professionals out there that are doing that so if you want someone to talk to um, going to talk to a stranger sometime can be really healthy because you it's really cathartic you don't have the reciprocation responsibility and you don't have to worry about them judging you because they don't know you. So what, I mean, who are they going to tell? They're not going to tell anybody. So um, talk to a professional, go find somebody who's offering pay what you can or offering a discount rate and go ahead and make that appointment. I think it's, um, it's, it'll be worth it. You'll, you'll find that you're getting a lot of um, value out of it. Something that you can do with small children is they can uh, talk to their stuffed animals. Um, they can tell stories, they can draw, they, so you know, help them get it out of their emotional space too because they have the same issue even though uh, their prefrontal cortex is not mature. Your prefrontal cortex isn't mature until you're 24. So anyone under 24 is going to have a harder time processing the emotions and managing it because they don't have the prefrontal cortex to do it. Um, the other thing you can do is write. And that, that could be journaling, that could be just writing on scratch paper, that could be doing mind mapping where you put something in the center and draw spokes out of it. So there's a lot of different options. Um, if you're concerned that someone's going to find it and read it, put it through the shredder, tear it up. Um, you know, if you have a wood burning fireplace, you can burn it. There are certainly um, a lot of different options that you can do when it comes to, to journaling. So if you don't want to talk, um, writing can be also be helpful. I need to wipe my nose. Sorry. A little bit runny. All right, so those are a couple of things. Uh, meditate, which Matthew talked about yesterday. I did want to share. Um, I've started a new technique called the Z technique, and it's from this book, um, Stress Less, Accomplish More. Um, the book itself, a lot of information in here that I don't think is necessary for you to be able to do the technique. Um, if you get the book, chapter eight is the meat. Read chapter eight. Um, the rest of it is interesting. She does a good job of telling stories, but um, the Z technique, you can also um, Google the Ziva technique, which is her online stuff. And um, it's for busy people. It's a different type of, of meditation than I've done before, and I'm getting good value out of it. Recommends for teens and college kids who are home. So I feel like teens and college kids can typically do the same things that adults do, um, except that they get bored faster because that generation seems to get bored faster than we do. So um, I have my coloring books are out, my colored pencils are out, my, uh, my pens are out, my 
uh, paints, my little paints are out. So anything, I've got a puzzle on our dining room table, our Jenga is out, our, all of our board games, like my house is a disaster because I've got all the stuff that we do um, out and about. So I would say get all those things out and just um, encourage them. Yeah, Emily Fletcher is great. She's the author of, of this book, uh, Stress Less, Accomplish More. And yes, thank you for writing that, Christine, Ziva Meditation. Um, and teens can meditate as well. There's a lot of different offense, off, options. I can't talk. Um, also, another fun thing to do, and this is something we give up as uh, somewhere between childhood and teen, we give up, but fantasizing and telling ourselves stories about what, what life is or what it could be or where we're going or what we're doing or just making things up. Um, as a teenager, I used to tell my friends stories because I had some younger friends and it was something we used to have fun doing. So, you know, tell yourself stories, make things up, fantasize, pretend. Children, little children are so good at that. And as adults, we, we tend to forget what fun that was. So I would encourage you to do that. Um, I'm hopeful as it starts to get warmer, I'm going to be able to get out and start doing my gardening again. So that's definitely something I'm excited to do. Um, so another tip, get enough sleep. And I know you hear this and everybody knows it's important and then nobody does it. So get enough sleep means have good sleep hygiene. I have an alarm on my phone that goes off at nine o'clock every night that says go to bed. And that is because you can get engaged, you know, doing a puzzle or doing whatever you're doing. And all of a sudden you look up and it's 1130. So I have an alarm that makes sure I go to bed on time every night and I've been very regimented about that. And I know some people are like, I can't go to bed that early, but at nine o'clock I you know, stop doing what I'm doing. We go, we, my husband and I go to bed together. We go up, we you know, do our night routine, we shower, wash my face. If I have makeup on, take my makeup off. Although now, you know, who's wearing makeup anymore? Because we're all home, who cares? If you're, unless you're on video, nobody cares if you have makeup on. But do all, you know, do all my stuff and we're in bed by 10 o'clock. Um, we have a very dark room. I have uh, blackout shades so that the light doesn't keep us awake. And we have made a rule. There's nothing that happens in our bed except for sleeping, snuggling, and sex. That's it. And it's, there's a lot of studies that say that if you have a TV in your bedroom, you are going to be less intimate with your partner, whether that means emotionally intimate or physically intimate because the TV is a distraction and so you don't end up engaging with your partner. So um, I would encourage you to uh, consider making your bedroom a place of only sleep and sex and snuggling fun stuff. Um, and continue to get up at the same time. I know it's really easy when you don't have a routine to start sleeping till 9, 30, 10 o'clock and staying up till two in the morning and really getting your circadian rhythm out of whack. And I'm gonna talk about circadian rhythm um, in a little bit because your stomach has a circadian rhythm too. And when you get your sleep out of whack, it messes up your stomach's digestion process. Uh, another thing that I've done recently is I got a weighted blanket. Um, that's been really helpful in helping me sleep. So I would definitely recommend. Yeah, no phones. Yeah, no phones in bed either. They're, they're not a good idea. So, um, but get, I, I love a weighted blanket. I grew up in a house where we didn't heat the bedrooms. And so we always had lots of army surplus blankets when I was little. And so I like sleeping under that weight and getting a weighted blanket has been really beneficial for me. So if that's something that you um, might, you might try that. A lot of people get a lot of value out of a weighted blanket. And the last tip I have about stress relief before we go on into eating is that, um, Physical contact is important for humans. That um, oxy, oxytocin that gets released when you're in physical contact with people is super important. So if you don't live alone, and I know if you live alone, it's really hard. I hope you have a pet. But if you don't live alone, you know, hold your kids, hold hands, snuggle on the couch, have sex with your partner. Do those things that allow you to have that skin-to-skin -skin contact. We know how important that is for newborns when they're first born to have skin-to-skin -skin contact, and we never lose that need. So. To reduce stress, skin to skin contact, super important. You have a weighted blanket too, that's awesome. They're, oh, they're great, they're awesome. I found one on sale for like 50 bucks on Amazon. So happy about that. All right, so that's a bunch of tips about um, stress relief are helpful for anxiety. Yes, you're right, which is stress related. So let's talk about eating. So um, there's, a, there's an interesting idea out there, and I see psychologists say this and it frustrates me, because for a lot of bad habits, 
um, people say just stop doing it. And they, that's what they say with smoking, they say with drinking, is just, you know, stop doing the, whatever the habit is, and then it'll, the desire to do it go, goes away. And that is true. And with eating, you can't stop eating, which is also true. But you can stop eating junk. And I think that that is a distinction that a lot of people in the, in the eating disorders and the, the eating space don't kind of, they don't make that distinction between Yes, you have to eat. You don't have to eat junk. And so that's uh, something interesting to talk about. Um, so why do we eat junk? We talked, we talked before about quick energy. When you're stressed, your body wants quick and easily digestible calories, which is salt, sugar, and fat. Super easy. Goes really quickly from your lips to your hips. No problem. Um, we also have the issue with that being there being a lack of nutrition in that and I don't know if you've ever had this happen I know that uh, I used to happen to me um, before I changed my eating habits where you've eaten a lot and your stomach is full you can physically feel that your stomach is full but you still have that desire that still munchy desire and that happens when you eat a lot of empty calories because your body can use the energy and calories to create fat it can absolutely do that store that we need that for later but it needs nutrition as well. And so if your body feels like you're getting a lot of empty calories, it's gonna keep saying, hey, I need some nutrition. Hey, I need, it. I need some nutrition. And unfortunately, if you continue to feed it empty calories, junk food, it's gonna to continue to tell you you're hungry even though you're not actually hungry for energy, you're hungry for nutrition. And so to offset that, you need to get more nutrition. And I'm gonna talk a little bit in a minute about foods you can eat that are gonna be high in nutrition value. Um, what I did want to share with you as well, there's a thing called the bliss point, which food pro processors, the food industry, has found that there's a specific point where there's an exact balance of fat, sugar, and salt, where it turns off your brain's ability to say, I've had enough. And it turns on what's called your cram function. And your cram function is an, uh, a function that used to be relevant back hundreds of years ago, thousands of years ago, when food was really um, not available regularly, when food that was high calorie food was available, your body needed to eat as much of it as it could, as fast as it could, regardless of how hungry you were, regardless of how much room there was in your stomach. And so it has that ability that when something is very high calorie, very uh, energy dense, to turn off the I'm full, stop eating, and just keep cramming it in. And when foods from the food industry hit that bliss point, which is really good for their bottom line, right? I mean, the more food you eat, the, the better, the more money they make. Um, it, you eat more of it because you're, you've turned on your cram function. So if you're eating things like Oreos, mm -hmm. Doritos, anything that is a processed food from the food industry has been manufactured, lots of money spent on it to hit your bliss point. Turn off your ability to say, no, thank you, I've had enough, and turn on your cram function. So that is something that you're struggling with. And what that also does is it puts you in what's called the pleasure trap. And the pleasure trap is the space where your taste buds have become so accustomed to salt, sugar, and fat that hit the bliss point, which don't exist in nature, that when you eat real food, your, your taste buds go, yuck, I don't like that, that doesn't taste good. And you end up in that space where you don't actually want to eat real food because your taste buds have become so accustomed to uh, things that hit the bliss point. And to get out of that, you basically just have to overcome it, stop eating junk and start eating real food. So things that can help with uh, stress eating uh, and, and emotional eating in general. Uh, notice when you're doing it. That's one of the first things I always try to help my clients do is notice when it happens. Most often it happens at night um, when your, your willpower is done, your, your willpower bucket is empty, you've used it on everything from not screaming at your kids and whatever all day, and at the end of the day there's no willpower left for you. So notice when you're doing it, and then notice why you're doing it. What, what are you looking for? The difference between happiness and pleasure. Pleasure is that short-term thing, we get it from sex, we get it from food, uh, we get it from a lot of those real quick things, and we call it happiness. It's not. Happiness is a long-term thing. Your long-term health creates happiness short-term things are pleasure so look for that um, talk about the circadian rhythm if your body burns calories that you eat earlier in the day differently 
faster, more effectively than it does calories you eat late at night. So they've done studies where they feed people the same amount of calories either in the morning, in the afternoon, or late at night. Same number, same, actually all the same, but the people who eat late at night end up with more of it on their hips because their circadian rhythm has slowed down. So you should eat your calories in the morning, eat really good, healthy, nutritious food in the morning. So heavy food in the morning and then lighter food at night, which is exactly the opposite the way most of us eat. Most of us eat really our biggest meal is our evening meal. And that is exactly backwards to how your circadian rhythm works. I know yesterday Matthew uh, said oatmeal. We eat oatmeal every day. Ours is a lot more calorie dense than his is. We put a lot of seeds in ours. We use a lot of flax seeds, uh, chia seeds, hemp seeds. Uh, we put a lot of spices, blueberries, bananas, um, strawberries, any berries, uh, raisins are really good. So we do a lot of really heavy calories uh, in, the, in the morning. Explains the sugar addiction theory. Yes, thank you. I'm glad that uh, that's understandable. How long do you take to find, it takes your taste buds to adjust once you're back on real food? As long as you eat real food consistently, your taste buds will adjust in about two weeks. Your taste buds change really, really rapidly. Um, I, interesting story, uh, we, we don't have jelly or preserves in the house very often, but recently Costco had some organic strawberry jelly, which happens to be my husband's favorite. So we bought it as a treat. And when we first got it, I was like, oh my goodness, this is so sweet. It was like cloyingly sweet to me. And by the time we finished the jar, and it was a, you know, it was a Costco sized jar, so it was a big jar. By the time we finished the jar, I noticed that my oatmeal that I eat in the morning was tasting bland. And I was like, it took me a little bit to put the two together. And I realized my taste buds had adjusted to the sweetness in the jelly. And so my regular oatmeal that I was, had happily eaten forever before that suddenly tasted bland. And so that the, we finished the jar, it went away, and now my oatmeal's fine again. So it only takes about two weeks for your taste buds to adjust as long as you aren't dripping salt, sugar, and fat on it where your, your taste buds don't change. That's the thing that's the hardest is getting your taste buds to change by actually eliminating the salt, sugar, and fat. Okay, so we talked about real food, giving your body nutrition, not just calories. We talked about circadian rhythm. Um, this, is, this one may come as a shock to you. Snack foods are not a must. Um, I know a lot of people say to me, oh, I have kids. I have to have snacks in the house. No, actually, you don't. Your kids don't need snacks either. I, I know they think they do, um, and it's easy for you for, to give them to them, and I, I get it. I'm not judging that. I'm just saying it's, it's not a need. So, um, yeah, it's just not a need. We'll just leave it there. Um, and one thing people like to say to me, oh, you know, I really like crunch. And I say, well, eat a carrot. And they're like, I don't want to eat a carrot. I said, then it's not the crunch that you want. It's the salt, the sugar, and the fat. So, you know, I, I'm all for telling yourself the truth about your food. If you're going to make choices like to eat potato chips or whatever your, your uh, go-to salt, sugar, and fat is, don't lie to yourself about it. Be honest with yourself about what you're doing. Um, I think it's amazing when you start telling yourself the truth, how your brain goes, wait, I don't, maybe I don't need those chips. Maybe, maybe I don't need to eat those. So tell yourself the truth about why you're choosing to eat what you eat. Cause it's probably cause it hits the, the, the bliss point and you're stuck in the pleasure trap. So then the next question I always get is, okay, so I can't eat all these uh, processed foods. What should I eat? So I have a few things here I want to share with you that um, we eat. I will tell you right up front, we are plant-based. That happened uh, about three years ago and not on purpose. I started doing research into nutrition and health. And just when you start doing the research, there's, it only leads one place. So I am going to give you tips about foods you can eat that are, are plant-based. And then I'll tell you some reasons why you want to avoid some of the animal foods. I'm not saying you have to eat, you have to be plant-based 100%. Absolutely not telling you that. It is ideal. But um, if you're looking for nutrition, you're going to get that from your plants. So the first thing I'm going to share with you is eat whole food starches. And um, I know people first go, oh my goodness, you're telling me to eat carbs. I am telling you to eat carbs, but I'm not telling you to eat junk food carbs. There are two different categories of carbohydrates. One of them are the processed carbs that you're going to get in the boxes, and they usually have salt and sugar attached to them and fat attached to them. Those are going to go straight to your hips, and that is because 
you know, you're, they have salt, sugar, and fat in them. It's not the carbs so much that are the problem. It's the salt, the sugar, and the fat. Your body likes to burn carbs for energy, and your body likes to burn carbs for heat. That's the first two things it's going to do with carbohydrates. So when I mean whole food starches, I'm talking about your beans. I'm talking about sweet potatoes. I'm talking about whole grains like oatmeal and quinoa and um, brown rice and bulgur and all of those, there's so many grains. Uh, if you're in Delaware and you go to the natural food store, although I'm not sure they're open right now, I know they closed for a little bit because they did have a, uh, someone come through there that tested positive. But they have their bulk section and they have a whole bunch of grains there. We, when we first started eating more grains, started going there and we would just like, okay, I don't know what this grain is, but we would buy it and I would Google it and figure out how do I cook this? What do I do with it? And we learned a lot of fun recipes that way, um, a lot of new grains. So definitely whole food starches. They are your friend. They, your body's going to use them for energy. They also have a lot of fiber in them, which is um, super good for you. Matthew talked about it yesterday. Fiber is going to help grab onto all the toxins and take it out of your body. It keeps your body regular. It reduces your risk of having colon cancer, which is super important. And your fiber only comes from plant foods. It's the only place you find it. So whole food starch is a great place to start. We eat a lot of starch. My diet is about 80% carbohydrates, which people freak out when they hear that because I am five foot nine, I weigh about 130 pounds and I eat about 80% carbs. Another one, great nutrition, your leafy greens. Your leafy greens are gonna help with uh, your ability to fight off infections. They're gonna help your immune system. They're gonna give you a lot of your, your iron. The darker the green, the better. Um, we like kale. I know a lot of people don't like kale, but you can eat beet greens, you can eat um, chard. Uh, there's so many things. Spinach is another good one. So your leafy greens, um, romaine isn't horrible. It's not ideal, but it isn't horrible. The only one that's, you know, doesn't have a whole ton of nutrition is iceberg lettuce, but it still does have fiber in it. It is still good for you. So if that's the only one you can eat, then eat that one. Um, fruits, obviously fruits are good for you. Citrus fruits are really good for you. Apples are in season right now. I'll give you a quick tip. If you're making anything like a soup or a stew and you want to add a little bit of kind of underlying sweetness to it, chop up some apples and throw it in there. You won't even notice them because they'll cook down and they make great flavor in your soups and your stews. Um, I made a huge batch, like I have a big stock pot of kind of a vegetable minestrone soup uh, over the weekend and I put three apples in it and it is so good. And we put, we put greens in the bowl and then we put the soup over the top of it and heat it up. Oh, now I'm ready for lunch. Um, broccoli, broccoli is a great one. Garlic, Ginger, if you can do ginger, I have a carrot ginger salad dressing that I make that's really, really good. And turmeric, we put turmeric in our uh, oatmeal every morning. And because of the other things we put in it, you don't even notice it. So, and if you're gonna do turmeric, add a little bit of black pepper, it makes it more bioavailable. So that's a great option. And then green tea. Green tea is a really good for your immune system as well. Um, but do not drink green tea with your green leafy vegetables because green tea does slow the absorption of iron from your green leafy vegetables. So drink your green tea, tea separately from your meals. Things that you're gonna to wanna to avoid, we talked about processed food, obviously gonna to wanna to avoid those. One that I tell people to avoid, they always makes them cry, is cheese. But cheese is very high in saturated fat. It has no fiber in it. It slows down your digestion. Um, and it doesn't really have a whole lot of value as far as nutrition goes. I know a lot of people eat it because they think it's a health food. It is not. It is addictive. It does create casomorphine in your brain. And I could do a whole separate thing on that. But yeah, cheese is something, especially if you're not getting the exercise you should, cheese is something you're going to want to avoid. Dairy in general is not a health food. Animal flesh is acidic. It does cause your body to work hard. It causes your uh, kidneys to go into hyperfiltration mode. So that's something to consider, the amount of animal flesh that you're eating. And I say flesh and not meat, because when I say meat, people think I mean red meat. When I say flesh, I'm meaning all of them, all the animals, whatever kind of flesh, whatever muscle you're eating, um, they are acidic and they are gonna cause a problem that includes fish. Uh, eggs, high in cholesterol, sugar, obviously, Alcohol, alcohol, all alcohol is a carcinogen. Red wine is the least horrible for you, but alcohol is a carcinogen. It's obviously gonna cause your body stress. It's hard on your liver, all of those things. And caffeine, because it is um, a stressor to your system, 
consider how much caffeine that, that you are uh, ingesting. So those are the tips that I had, had for you. Um, obviously, reducing your stress is going to be one of the easiest ways to stop doing engaging in stress eating and to avoid the fit, uh, what are we call it quarantine 15. Uh, we don't want to gain that weight. So if you guys have any questions, definitely reach out to me. You can find me, my website for, um, for the Whole Food Muscle Club and our book, How to Feed the Human, is wholefoodmuscle.com. You can also message me here on Facebook. I'm pretty good about keeping uh, an eye on my other messages from people who are not friends because I do have people reaching out to me. Like I said, I am offering sessions for people which you pay what you can right now. So I would encourage you, if you want to have a conversation about food, about performance, about stress, about you know whatever, I'm happy to have that conversation with you. Just reach out to me and set it up. Um, again, it's Whole Food Muscle. I will put that in the comments. Um, when we uh, when we get done here, or I'll add it to the top maybe. But um, I'm thrilled that you guys were here. Thank you so much. And if I can help you, uh, please do reach out. Let me make sure. It looks like we may have one more comment. Yes, thank you. I read a little longer than I intended to, but I had so much I wanted to share. So thanks for having me, and I hope to hear from you guys. Have a great day. Enjoy the sunshine.